curricular reading with more than 20 years of service in developing countries in sub-Saharan Africa and Asia. He is currently serving as Global Research Program Director, Genetic Gains and Director, Center of Excellence in Genomics and System Biology at the ICRISAT Hyderabad. He is an honorary and adjunct professor in 10 universities or institutes in Australia, China, Ghana, and India, including the University of Western Australia and the University of Queensland, Australia. He is a globally recognized leader for his work on genome sequencing, genomics assisted breeding, and translational genomics in legume and cereal crops and capacity building in developing countries. Professor Vashni has made centrally important contributions to improve food security in several developing countries of Africa and Asia by creating genomic resources of 10 major orphan tropical crops, including pigeon pea, chickpea, groundnut, and permalate. He and his colleagues have developed and deployed DNA marker technologies for the identification of useful genetic variation in these key crops. For instance, his colleagues and he used these resources to identify genetic loci and candidate genes for drought and pest tolerance in key staple crops for developing countries. He has initiated and led major international programs that are creating and delivering superior crop varieties to some of the world's poorest farmers. For his outstanding and seminal contributions, Professor Vashni has been honored with several fellowships, awards, and honorary positions at international level. For instance, Professor Vashni is an elected fellow of all four science academies of India, including INSA, NASI, IASC, and NAS. Several foreign science academies, including German National Science Academy, the World Academy of Science, American Association for Advancement of Science, Crop Science Society of America, and American Society of Agronomy, an honorary fellow of Indian Society of Pulses Research and Development, and Arid Zone Research Association of India. He is recipient of several prestigious awards, including Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Award 2015, the most coveted KK Virla Award from Government of India, GD Birla Award for Scientific Research 2018 from KK Birla Foundation, Professor Lalji Singh Achievement Award 2019 by Adnet, Professor Jay Shankar Life Achievement Award 2019 by Pandit Jay Shankar Telangana State Agriculture University, Uttar Pradesh Government Samman 2018, Outstanding Faculty Research Award 2018 by Career 360 in India, and Quilu Frank. Friendship Award 2016 by People's Government of Shandong Province, China. Research Excellence India Citation Award 2015 by Thomson Reuter USA. The Illumina Agricultural Greater Good Initiative Award USA 2013. IPGI Science Leadership Award USA 2017. Young Crop Scientist Award 2013 of Crop Science Society of America. In addition to above, she has been honored in several other countries, including Nepal, the Philippines, Vietnam, and United Arab Emirates University, Al Ain. Professor Vashni has published more than 300 papers in high impact factor journals, including 15 papers in Nature Journals. He has been recognized as highly cited researcher by Thomson Reuters for last six years in a row and one of 10 most influential. Indian scientist by Times of India, a leading Indian daily newspaper. So this is a, just a glimpse of Dr. Vashni's vast experience and expanse of work, owing to which he is rightly known as the genomics guru among scientific fraternity. Thank you very much. Over to Dr. Sharat Tiwari, sir. Uh, uh, thank you, Ashish. Uh, and uh, now I think we can start uh, the presentation and then uh, we'll have uh, some uh, observations by our Dean Faculty, Dr. Dhiren Khare, and we'll uh, finish it uh, with a uh, vote of thanks. So, uh, Dr. Vashne, for your presentation. Hello, sir. Uh, good afternoon, madam. 
good afternoon everybody so good afternoon everybody for joining this talk and i'm grateful to our colleagues from jnkvb i am very happy to note that uh, professor dhirendra khare dean faculty of agriculture is there professor sharath tiwari head of department is there and i think dr om gupta madam will also be there who, and uh, i am very happy to see dr anita babbar and also Thanks. my friend and uh, my colleague former colleague ashish kumar so i'm really very happy to give this talk and with jnkbv we had different kind of collaborations including with the one of your college uh, in shohar also so dr yasin so anyway so this is great pleasure and thanks a lot for inviting me for this talk so what i will do that i will talk about some advances in chickpea genomics and molecular breeding and those of you who would like to follow me on the twitter they can note this twitter handle rajwarshne and before we start in the beginning itself i would like to mention some colleagues especially although there are lots of colleagues from our center who are also joining this talk but especially would like to mention mahender and manish and hema and anu who really did lot of work supervising lot of work in chickpea genomics in our center and also helped me to put this presentation so thank you very much guys but at the same time i'm having several phd student post docs in the group and many of them they are already joining this talk so thanks everybody so now let's talk about chickpea and i think that people from madhya pradesh for them they do not need to know that what is chickpea because they know everything about chickpea and madhya pradesh state is the largest chickpea growing state in india nevertheless some other colleagues other than madhya pradesh who have joined this presentation i have seen olu who is also one of my phd student from university of queensland he is in brisbane so he is starting his phd in chickpea so will be good for him also to know that chickpea is an excellent source of high quality protein and this is having a range of amino acids which are required for us around the world chickpea is grown in 14.77 million tons and india australia myanmar they are the larger producers but at the same time india also imports and in terms of uh, different uh, chickpeas we have desi and kabli and uh, more than uh, so basically during different so this is that importance of chickpea so now in the case of chickpea that we have lot of issues but what we would like to do that maybe that i can tell here that in chickpea chickpea crop is grown in marginal lands which is where this is exposed to terminal drought salinity there are other issues as well pod borer wilt blight and botrytis gray mold so because of all these reasons the crop productivity is about less than 1 ton per hectare so what we need to do that we need to basically try to address the issue that we need to have the stress tolerance we need to bring the resistance and we need to enhance the nutrition so for all doing all these things we need to use some genomics and molecular breeding approaches which includes genetic diversity link analysis linkage mapping candidate gene identification diagnostic marker development and then their use in marker assisted selection and back crossing and early generation screening genomic selection so we will be talking some of these approaches later so now this particular slide here few minute few i think in 2018 or so we discussed that how the genomics can develop deliver the climate change ready crop so i was talking that uh, we have discussed that how the genomics can deliver these climate change ready varieties and for that purpose we have mentioned that well we need to use this germplasm resources and then we need to use the genomics and phenomics platform then we can identify the genes or markers associated with the different traits then we can go through the genomics assisted breeding or pre breeding and we can develop the climate resilient crops and recently we also talked another approach of breeding and we call it 5g breeding approach and what we say in this 5g that not this is not the cellular technology 5g but this is more in the related to that uh, genomics so this year we have discussed about this 5g's and we think that we need to have the first g for the genome that for any crop when we talk we need to have the genome assemblies second g is for the germplasm and for the germplasm means that this should be characterized at the genome and agronomic level 
third G is for the genes that we need to identify the genes associated with the different traits. And then we need to use those things in the genomic breeding. And finally, there's a new platform called gene editing. So we need to have these five Gs approach and then we can really deliver good varieties for any trait. Now, in this context, at ICRI said few years back, we initiated, we established a center, we call it Center of Excellence in Genomics and Systems Biology in 2007, we, where we have the possibility to undertake large scale sequencing and the genotyping. And once you generate this sequencing and genotyping data, then you need to analyze this data. For this, you need to have the good computational infrastructure. At our center, Center of Excellence in Genomics and Systems Biology, we got around 600 cores, which are equivalent to about 600 computers, 830 terabyte storage, 7.5 terabyte RAM. And when you have these kind of thing, then we can use these data for a variety of applications. And uh, we have been working with large number of partners around the world, including JNKVB and also many other partners in Madhya Pradesh and India and abroad. So during last few years, through this uh, center, we have been successful to sequence about nine different crop genomes. And we also have developed molecular breeding varieties. And of course, our breeders at Ecrisat and our national partners, they have done this work. But good news is that five lines have already been released. In terms of the scientific advances, our group has colleagues have published around 15 papers in Nature Journals during last 10 to 12 years. And one of the important aspects of the center is that we are having really good partnership. We are having more than 180 organizations from 35 countries. We also emphasize on the capacity building. So we keep on organizing these training courses and conferences. So this is another thing. So anyway, during the, as I said, so we are, we have done a lot of work in this aspect. And one thing which I would like to mention that through the center, we have sequenced the genomes, because if you want to do something in any crop, it will be good idea to understand the genes, the architecture of the genome. And in this aspect, we have sequenced the genome of pigeon pea, chickpea, palmillet, and also two diploid genomes of groundnut and two tetraploid different kind of species of groundnut in 2019. And not only that, we have been working with other colleagues and collaborators around the world, and we also contributed to sequence the genome of sesame, moonbean, Ajukivin, etc. So in summary, our center has done a lot of work in the area of genome sequencing, but I will not discuss about these things in this talk. Because here I would like to talk more about uh, basically in the area of chickpea genomics that what we have done in chickpea. So what I will do that I will discuss first that what kind of genomic resources we have in chickpea. Then second is that what kind of functional genomics platform we have. Then third, we will discuss the how we are identifying the genes for different traits. And then finally, I would like to mention that how we are using these markers in the breeding program. So let's develop, talk about the first genomic resources. So as, as I said, that in the case of chickpea, we did not have good resources earlier. We used to, many people used to call this crop like orphan crop. But way back in 2013, together with different partners, including ICR, we have sequenced this chickpea genome. And at that time point, we were able to capture about 74% genome in the scaffold. But now this genome has been improved further. At that time point, we, our analysis provided about 28,000 genes. And this was the first time that we got large scale SSR and SNP marker. So this was one genome. But then we realized that one genome will not be enough because if you see the germplasm collection around the world, there are more than 1700 gene banks around the world, which is having about 7.4 million accessions. And uh, in the case of chickpea, if you see, sorry, we got more than 20,000 accessions in the case of chickpea. So it's a really good idea to characterize those 20,000 accessions at the genomic level and the phenomic level. I know this is a huge work. We cannot do everything in just one instance, but somebody can start this work. And then the most important aspect is that we don't want to sequence them for fun. Rather, we need to associate the allele with the phenotype. So now when we have this new form of the gene, how we can associate with the allele, and this is important. And finally, our plan is to transfer those alleles in the elite variety. So this is that plan. With this objective, what we did that we have started to working in this aspect. 
and then the first instance what we did that we have sequenced around uh, 35 genotypes this was old story and at that time point after sequencing these 35 chickpea genotypes which were the parents of the different mapping populations we identified about 2 million SNPs and then after that to be kept on moving like this kind of thing and then what we did that we also sequenced around 129 chickpea varieties which are released in 10 different countries India, Canada, Australia etc which we had the Desi and Kavli genotypes we did a lot of analysis several things came out one is that again large scale SNP resources second is that what are the regions that we are having narrow genetic diversity in the case of chickpea and how we can redefine the breeding program in chickpea. So this was that uh, analysis. And then recently or last year we have completed the sequencing of about other 429 chickpea accessions from 45 countries. And this was the first time that we have sequenced at that scale. We generated about 1.8 terabyte sequencing data and we got about 4.9 million SNPs. This also helped us to identify the genes which have been undergone the selection pressure during the domestication. Secondly, that during the breeding, that when we have moved from the land races to breeding, that what kind of selection pressure we had. And on top of that, we also have done the phenotyping of these 429 lines. And based on the GWAS analysis, I will discuss later that how you can associate sequence with the phenotyping data. And we identified the genes associated with markers for heat and drought tolerance. So this is the way that we can do this kind of work. And on top of that, we have taken this big program and we are having this 3000 chickpea genome sequencing initiative. Under this initiative, we are having several organizations from um, around the world and many organizations from India as well involved. And by doing these things, we are having se completed the sequence of more than 3366 samples from Madhya Pradesh, from the Siho, Dr. Yasin is also part of that program. And we have generated about 40 million SNPs. And now sequencing is one thing, but the other thing is, we thought that we need to phenotype these 3000 chickpeas. And this is initially when I was talking to breeders, they say, wow, we have never done this 3000 lines, how we are going to do it. But nevertheless, we did that evaluation at different location. And you can see here in Rajasthan, Uttar Pradesh, Madhya Pradesh and Bhopal and Shihor and here in Patancharu, Junagar, so different places. And we and all these colleagues, they have collected the phenotyping data for large number of traits, which are important for breeding and also for the nutritional traits. So this is the way that we are moving. And these are some picture that from Shihor and from uh, Ikrisat Patancharu and from IIPR, from Junagar Agriculture University. So now we have collected the phenotyping data from six different locations for two different years and now we are in process of analyzing these data once you identify these large scale SNPs and in the breeding program our plan is our emphasis is that how we can make this genotyping very cost effective earlier people were using ssr markers or even SNP markers but these are very expensive so what we did we developed one SNP array and this array is like chip kind of thing and on this chip you are having more than 70,000 SNPs so basically yeah, so 60,000 SNPs we are having this available on this chip so what does it mean that if you would like to genotype if you would like to analyze the DNA of a plant with this chip you will get the data for 60,000 SNPs in a single go and by using this SNP array we have developed high density genetic maps and the population of ICC 4958 and 182 and ICC 283 So by using these kind of things, we can develop large high density genetic maps. So these areas that are available, anyone who is working in chickpea genetics and breeding, if they would like to have the genotyping of their population, we will be happy to share those areas and we will be happy to organize this genotyping with these areas. So this is about this uh, SNP array. And so basically I wanted to tell that how we have sequenced the genome, how we have done the resequencing initiated from the 35 line, then we moved to 129 lines, then we moved to 429 lines. Now we have done the 3000 and we have a plan to sequence now 10,000, then eventually 20,000. So that's the way we need to move on. So basically we would like to catalog all sequence variation so that in future we can use this information to redefine our breeding program. Now, the other approach is that if you would like to identify the genes and then for that we need to use the functional genomics approaches, what you do that here you identify the genes and this is directly associated with the different traits. And here 
we have been doing a lot of work but now i would like to pick up some some uh, recent work not everything so some of my <coughs> colleagues sorry they have developed this gene expression atlas and what is this gene expression atlas so atlas is like when we were uh, studying the geography in our grade 5 or grade 6 at that time point we were used to given this atlas that well please find out which place is in rajasthan or which place is the chera puji where you are having highest rain etc so we used to find those places in the map the same thing when we say in the case of chickpea we got 28000 genes but now we need to identify that which gene is present or expressed in which tissue at what time so to address these issues what we have done we have done the rna seq analysis for about more than 30 different tissues and then analyzed all these things together and now we are having better idea so that's the region we call it gene expression atlas so we got this information gene expression atlas and then we kept on using these kind of information for different functional genomics study one of our phd student vanika what she has done that she has set up this experiment where she wanted to identify the genes related to escochyta blight and what she did that she has taken these three different genotypes did the rna seq analysis and not only that functional genomics or rna seq she has used that integrative approach of transcriptome small rna and degradome sequencing for the three resistant and two susceptible genotypes and based on this analysis and by using the gene ontology analysis and the comprehensive analysis we could identify 12 perfectly coherent micro rna and mrna pairs so you can see that in one side if you are having this higher up, up regulation then you are having this down regulation so we got perfectly coherent micro rna mrna pairs and this indicates that escochyta blight resistance is mediated through micro rna so now this is the way that now some people who are interested to use the gene editing approach or gm approach they can target these kind of genes so this is you know, this approach and then other colleague of ours sadhna she was trying to identify the neck genes in chickpea so what we did that this neck genes they are associated with the drought tolerance and then we have analyzed the chickpea genomes on the different crops and we identified the 14 crates on the, which represent about 72 neck proteins and based on the analysis eventually we identified 21 putative stress responsive genes then we try to analyze these things on the express and analysis on the drought tolerant and susceptible genotypes and would like to identify which particular genes they are associated with drought tolerance similarly other colleagues of ours shalaja she has been working on the heat stress and what we do here that we have targeted three different genotypes and then by combined by using this rna seq analysis micro rna analysis and link rna analysis we are trying to identify the genes which are associated with the heat tolerance so this is the way things keep on moving and finally i would like to mention one work and this is about this climate change related study where my colleague hema bindu paramita palet and other colleagues they have tried to understand that when we are having this different level of this carbon dioxide then how that there is a up regulation and down regulation of the genes and can be manipulate those genes even at that is level right now when we are facing the issue of the carbon dioxide so these things are very informative informative so now based on these things we can be ready we can already prepare develop the new chickpea varieties which can cope up that stresses of the heat or drought or different kind of thing in the in in coming years when we climate change will be the serious problem so this was about the functional genomics so basically you can identify those genes now third is that either you get the markers or the QTLs through the genomic resources or the functional genomics, we need to identify the markers or genes which are associated with the trait and they can be used in the breeding program. So here we will be, I will be talking a little bit about the genomic approaches that how we are doing the trait mapping. And in this regard, so for instance, we are having this uh, two approaches. So sometimes people use the linkage mapping approach when you are having the biparental mapping population like F2 population, recombinant in red lines. And here this shows that now these are the different individuals of this population and then the segregate for seed weight. Now, for instance, this line is having higher seed weight. This line is having lower seed weight. And now when you have these different population, what we do, we genotype or sequence these population and also phenotype and then try to associate the trait. So for instance, wherever we have this red color segment then we can say this is associated with the small seed size whenever we are having this green blue color thing we can say this is that 
bigger seed size. Now, other approach is genome wide association mapping or GWAS analysis. Here, what we do, we sequence these different individuals. So, for instance, one, two, three. These three individuals, they are having taller plant. These three individuals, they are having the shorter plant. And when we sequence, when you analyze, then you can identify that, okay, this A nucleotide is associated with taller plant. The T is with the associated with shorter plant. So we keep on doing these kind of approaches. And in the case of chickpea, we are using both approaches, linkage mapping as well as association mapping. And I will be giving some of these examples that how we will like to do this thing. Here... So for this thing, we need to develop the molecular marker genetic maps. And I think uh, this work was from Ashish, who is now in JNKBB. At that time, Ashish and Neha, they developed this high density genetic map way back in 2011, where they developed that molecular markers coming from the genes. And I think this was really one of those highly cited paper. Thanks a lot, Ashish, for working with us on this aspect. And in the similar way, we have some other genetic maps, like for instance, for the drought tolerance, now salinity, seed size, etc. So we keep on developing those kind of genetic maps. And then we, so basically when we have the genetic map now in the case of drought, based on the phenotyping data, then we identify the QTL. So for instance, in this particular map, the red color segment, they're coming from two different population and they are the associated with the drought tolerance. This is a consensus map and several other students of mine like Deepa or now Ruthwig, they are working on this particular aspect and they're moving further. But I will discuss about this QTL hotspot later because we identified this QTL hotspot that contains the QTLs for 26 drought tolerance related traits. So this is really interesting. Recently, Manish and other colleagues, they have identified some QTLs for salinity and also seed size. So we keep on working on these different aspects. Now, not only for those stresses, but also for the nutrition trait like iron and zinc. And here, Mahinda Tude is working with some colleagues with US Raichur. And by doing these analysis, we have identified three QTLs for iron and zinc concentration on the different chromosomes. So basically, you have the possibility to enhance those kind of nutrients also through the molecular breeding and we will discuss later. Now, this is another thing. And here, Mahinder is working with several colleagues and I think from JNKBB also with Ashish. And this is the recently funded project where we are interested to identify the markers associated with the rootless and nematode in chickpea. And here we are using the genetic and genomic approaches and rootless and nematode is creating a lot of issue in uh, uh, chickpea in Madhya Pradesh. This slide is coming from Dr. S. P. Tiwari. And now the idea is again that by doing the phenotyping of mini core collection there in Madhya Pradesh and by doing the genotyping sequencing here, we would like to identify the markers associated with these rootless nematodes. So I think that this will be really good project and we should have some nice results in coming years. Now, the last thing is I was talking earlier about this linkage mapping based approach. Now we would like to talk the GWAS analysis. So you remember I was talking that we sequenced 429 lines. What we did, we also phenotype these 429 lines for the roots, for agronomic traits, for different physiological traits. And then we analyze these data together. And based on these GWAS analysis, we have identified the genes for many traits, including root surface area, root volume, days to flowering, and these are the genes, they are the different functions. And nowadays we are in process in, in analysis of in analyzing of these genes in details. So this is one aspect of the GWAS analysis. And here we also identified some genes which are associated with the yield under heat stress and the drought tolerance. And this the way that we keep on moving. And finally, recently, together with the, some colleagues from Uni University of Western Australia, we have also did the GWAS analysis for phosphorus huge efficiency. This is another important trait which is coming now in the case of chickpea. So this is the way that things are moving. And recently, we also have done the GWAS. Like again, on this reference set, we have done the analysis for the 11 nutritional trait. We have done that analysis with the 237,000 markers. And we have identified the genes for the beta carotene, iron, phytic acid, vitamin B1, zinc, etc. So this is in this direction, we have done this lot of analysis for the nutrition related trait. So I was telling that we have used the biparental mapping population. We have used the GWAS analysis by using the reference set. Now we have also developed a set new type of mapping population called magic population, which was developed by Dr. Purangar in collaboration with us in one project and what Dr. Puran God did that he has taken these eight different genotypes, developed very nice population and here he got around 1200 F8 progenies. 
then what we did we sequenced the entire population and then uh, we got the sequencing data and after that we also got the phenotyping data on this population from dr puran gaur and other colleagues and then when we did the analysis we got the markers associated with the seed weight harvest index etc so this is the and now this is that example that when you do the magic analysis this is the magic population here you can get these peaks of markers which are associated with the yield our 100 seed weight in 2013 in 2014 as well as in the average uh, of both of this year so this is the way that you can keep on analyzing these markers associated with the different trade so in summary my friends we have done a lot of analysis and we have been successful to map about 20 to 50 trades in chickpea which includes the drought tolerance heat tolerance salinity tolerance escocytoblite helicorpa nutrition so we have been working on these different aspects so I covered three topics so far. One is the genomic resources. Other was, was the functional genomics. Third was the trait mapping. So in the end, we have got markers, genes for different traits. Now, if you would like to use everything in the breeding, this may not be possible because you need to do the validation. But for some of these traits, we already start to use in the breeding program. And now I will share some of these examples that how we can take those genes which we have identified from the genome and we can take them to the field. So in this aspect, we are using the different approaches like marker assisted back crossing, marker assisted recurrent selection, genomic selection. I will discuss only a few examples. And in the case of chickpea, as I was telling earlier, that we have this QTL hotspot for drought tolerance, which appeared in two different populations. And this contains that QTLs for 13 out of 20 drought tolerance related trait and explain up to 58.2% phenotypic variations. So this is really good. But what we did that basically here at Ikrisat, Dr. Puran Gaur and many other partners, they started to introgress this line in that the QTL water spot in top class varieties. And here this is that some picture of Dr. Chaturvedi, Dr. L.P. Singh from IAPR, Dr. G.P. Dikshit is not here, but we are having really good collaboration with these different ACRIP, coordinate, ACRIP programs. Dr. Puran Gaur and Mahendra Tudi. So anyway, so what we did that we have done this and we have introgressed the segment in the elite varieties, for instance, the JG11. Dr. Anita Babbar and Dr. Om Gupta, Madam, and many other chickpea breeders who work in chickpea, they know that JG11, again, this variety came from Madhya Pradesh, and this is one of the most drought tolerant variety. But now no other variety could beat JG11 in terms of the yield under rain fed conditions. But what we did that we in progress the QTL hotspot in this JG11. We did the multi-location evaluation. We found several lines which are having higher yield than JG11. And then these lines were evaluated in India, Kenya, Ethiopia, different places. And based on these exam results or so, first variety for throw marker associated back crossing was released in Ethiopia. And this was in the genetic background of the JG11. And this was having even the higher yield. 15% higher yield over this uh, check variety and 78% more yield on the local check. And this is the variety for the drought tolerance developed through molecular breeding. So this is one of those success story. The other success story in the case of chickpea, this is coming from Dr. Bhardwaj from IRI. And what Dr. Bhardwaj did that he introgressed this QTL hotspot in the genetic background of PUSA 372. And then by doing this multi-location evaluation or so, we got these lines which are having 16% higher yield than PUSA 372 genotypes. And through the support of ACRIP program of Dr. G.P. Dekshir and Dr. N.P. Singh, uh, director of IAPR, this variety was released last year. And uh, so this became the other success story of marker-assisted back-crossing program or so. And I was told that not only that through ICRISAT or through IRI, our job is to help our partners. Now for the drought tolerance at IAPR, there are some improved lines in the genetic background of DCP 92-3 from IRI in the genetic background of PUSA 362. So some of these lines, they're in the advanced stage in the AVT to trial of ACRIP. And we hope that some of these lines will also be released very soon. So for the drought tolerance. Now let's talk a little bit quickly about the Escochita blight and Fugirum. So for Escochita, so for Fugirum will be identified some markers. And now you can see that this is the susceptible variety. You cannot see anything or so. But now when we introgressed that Fugirum wilt resistant gene in this genetic background, we converted this line like this kind of thing. You can see now the same thing for Escochita blight. And here this is the line. But now when we introgress that resistant gene for Escochita blight through marker assisted back crossing, we converted these lines like that. 
so anyway so we have done this demonstrated this thing but the success story came from two places one is from karnataka and then in the case of karnataka us dharwad us raichur dr mannur he introduced this segment in annigri variety and dr anita babbar as a part of one of our dvt project she was introducing the segment in the jg 74 line uh, 74 background and i think that uh, the line which came from annigri background this was found very high resistance and as a part of the acre program this variety was released with the name of super annigri one and this is mavc wr sa1 last year i am assuming that dr anita babbar madam she needs to also carry forward her line in the genetic background of jg 74 either at the acrip level or maybe the state variety release committee level so we are looking forward to hear see this kind of products from you madam as well anyway so this was the success story that how you can have this uh, varieties coming from this molecular breeding program now there are some new approaches like genomic selection program which my colleague manish rodkiwal is uh, leading here at ecrisat and what we are doing here we take one training population and then we do the genotyping and also do the phenotyping at different location in collaboration with dr bhardwaj we are doing the phenotyping at iri and here with the srinivasan and dr gaur we are doing at ecrisat and then based on these analysis we are trying to understand that well whether this genomic selection will work in chickpea or not so and some of the initial results they have shown that gs breeding will be really very very helpful and we have then the performance prediction and they indicate that we can really enhance the seed yield and now with the help of the national program under the acre uh, program we are trying to evaluate the straining population at different location if some of you are interested we will be very happy to work with you so basically our idea is to generate the new set of the lines through this genomic selection lastly and when you are having these new varieties but even coming from the molecular breeding or traditional breeding but many times they do not reach to the farmers and one of the reason is the varietal replacement rate is very low the extension program is not very good or convincing farmer is not very easy so as a part of another project from the department of agriculture and cooperation we have been working with the diff six different states in india and here this is the picture from sihor and some villages near to sihor where we also organize the farmer fairs and what we are doing that we are promoting the superior varieties irrespective from molecular breeding or traditional breeding coming from madhya pradesh or maharashtra or from any state and when we see that well these varieties need to be promoted to the different level so we have done this thing and here this is dr yasin many of you may be knowing about dr yasin he is doing really good work in this aspect so i think this is another interesting or important thing for us as a chickpea scientist that we need to promote we need to work with this krishi vigyan kendra or different program so that we can promote these new varieties now in the end i would like to conclude my presentation with uh, two more slides quickly one is that not only this genetics so i have was talking a lot about the sequencing and genetics and the breeding but one of the important thing is that when we develop these varieties they need to reach to the farmers for that we need to strengthening the seed system and this needs to be the formal or informal seed system we need to have the faster varietal replacement rate and we need to provide uh, high quality seeds to the farmers in time and cost effective manner and lastly that not only the providing the seeds agronomy also import play a very important role so in the case if we are providing the high quality seeds we also need to provide it the agronomy packages to farmers and lastly we need to also provide access of farmers to markets through the digital agriculture tools so that when farmers can when farmers get the produce they should also get the higher price so this is basically integrated and coordinated approach and if we can do this thing then only we can deliver higher genetic gains in farmer fields and we can bring the prosperity to the small holder farmers so this was the thing and lastly that what we think that how chickpea breeding needs to happen in my opinion and based on what our discussion with our colleagues or so and we published these two papers one in 2019 2020 we believe that this is the time now to move towards sequencing based breeding so starting that parental lines starting the different segregating progenies and technology have advanced so well that we can integrate the sequencing technology in the breeding program and we believe that when we are having these parental selection this needs to be selected based on the genes based on which are coming from the jivas or functional genomics analysis or the phenotyping data 
So here we need to spend a lot of time. And when we go to the different progenies, then we need to use these high quality sequencing, phenotyping, prediction models to keep on selecting the better lines so that we can develop the better varieties in the faster manner. With these uh, slides, I, and I think I would like to summarize the presentation now. That I think the take home message from my presentation is that genomic resources or trade mapping and transnational genomics for chickpea improvement is not an issue anymore. This is no more an orphan crop. We, you can do each and everything in this crop, what you can do in rice and other crops. Genome sequence is available. We are having the resequencing, genome wide association mapping, functional genomics, and you can use any approach and we can identify the candidate genes by using these different approaches. I gave the example that we can use successfully marker assisted back crossing or marker assisted selection. So these are not the approaches in the paper, published paper. Now these are the products in the field. So this is the way that we need to take these kind of products to the farmers. Now we can use the new approaches like haplotype based breeding or the genomic selection. And as I mentioned lastly, the varietal replacement rate is important, agronomy and market access is important. And if we would like to be successful, we should not be shy to have the partnership. In my opinion, more partnership, more probability of the success, provided your partners are good. And we have been lucky to have really good partners around the world. And I already mentioned several partners in my talk. In the end, a big thank you to the, all the partners, donors and supporters, and all the colleagues from JNKVB and all of my colleagues from CGSV. I know that they have joined this presentation. I cannot mention each and everybody's name. But and all the partners from ICRI said our breeding program, pathology, physiology, entomology and genomics program. So thanks a lot. And uh, thank you very much once again for your attention. And I will be happy to answer any question if you have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Vasne. Yeah, thank you so much, sir, for your wonderful presentation and very important enlightening all of us regarding chickpea molecular being approaches, uh, genomics, which has given us uh, much enlightenment. Now I would like to request the participant whosoever wants to ask any questions from Dr. Sri. Audience, please. Uh, hello. Please go ahead. We can hear you. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Good afternoon, sir. My name is Swati Saraswat, and I'm PhD scholar in JNKVP. So I have attended that Amity University lecture of yours, in which uh, you have uh, quoted that out of thirty thousand plants, which are edible plants, which is which are edible, we only use three to four as staple crops, and uh, we can have smart crops like millet. So. So my question is, what kind of modifications or interventions are needed in millets so that we can use them as staple crops? So this is a very good question. and uh, But you are asking that question from Amity talk in the JNKBB presentation. No problem. <laughs> but here the thing is that basically these staple crops now, the three staple crops, they have become the staple crops because of the taste, because of number of regions around the world. It's really difficult to change them. And I never say that we need to change them. But what one can do that we need to diversify our diets. We need to bring the additional crops, including millets. And now what we need to do that somehow this millet has become a synonym of the poverty or the poor people. For instance, earlier time, only the poor people who cannot afford that wheat or maize or rice, they were eating millet. So one is that we need to remove the social stigma. Second is that we need to bring some additional thing in the millet. So like, for instance, we can get the easily available or easily ready food from this rice. We can prepare rice quickly. We can do these things. So some of these quality traits, we need to bring those things in the millet. We, and nowadays, a lot of work is going in this direction where they are coming up with the different recipes. You can go to the supermarkets. They can prepare. You can find a lot of stuff in this direction. And the most important part in the millet is that they are very nutritious. So basically, from the perspective of nutrition, one needs to have the integration of the millet diets also together with wheat, rice, and other crops. So everything is important, but basically we need to see that uh, we do not need to just feed ourselves, but the nutrition is also very important. Thank you, sir. Any other question from this chickpea related talk from Madhya Pradesh? Hello, sir. Yes, please. 
हेलो सर माय सेल्फ गुड प्रीतपुर एंड माय क्वेश्चन इज इज सेलेनिटी टॉलरेंस इन चिक पी इज एसोसिएटेड विद द ड्यूरेशन ऑफ वैरायटी सो वी हैव नॉट एनालाइज्ड इन दिस एस्पेक्ट but this will depend that for instance that uh, in which area you are growing the variety what time this uh, so anyway honestly speaking we have not analyzed in this direction okay but for drought this is definitely the thing that well and that's the re region that in the case of drought people will always develop the early maturing variety so that they can skip the drought sir i am working on chickpea salinity and uh, during this uh, research what i had observed uh, the varieties in which the 50% flowering is much earlier as compared to the others uh, they complete their life cycle but okay. if the flowering is late then uh, uh, the crop is quite sensitive and that leads to the uh, the plants ultimately dies yeah so basically idea is that if you reach at the reproductive stage early and if you at that time salinity affect then anyway you already got that basically the pod formation so this is good i understand yes sir yeah. yes thank you sir uh, sure. dr washne this is dhirendra khare from jnk vv jabalpur uh, we have one problem we have one problem that when uh, irrigation facility is enhanced then that farmer from uh, shifted from chickpea to wheat and yes. it is uh, they say that uh, chickpea is not responsive to management yes and uh, when they go for irrigation or fertilizer then it behaves like that Uh, it is not yet perfectly domesticated so is it possible by your molecular breeding approach that we can enhance this rate of domestication or we can breed a variety which can respond to management so that they it can compensate up to the wheat this yeah. is a major problem in np so very good question sir and uh, this is very frequently happening pro well frequently frequent problem in india and other places two regions one is that whenever people like basically farmers would like to grow chickpea in those areas where you cannot grow anything huh? but now if yeah, they are provided the irrigation then they go for wheat and rice and other thing like this thing and what you mentioned you are right i also have noticed this thing that if you provide this irrigation or so then instead of enhancement well you have some enhancement of the yield but not to that uh, expectation so basically we need to do some partitioning of this reproductive phase versus vegetative phase so that we should not have this growth only at the vegetative level how we can have the partitioning of those traits at the metabolism level so this is possible but i doubt that any of us has done so far any work in this direction and i think we need to have a different kind of variety so that they can be more responsive <laughs> to those kind of agronomy or to those irrigation so this is required but i doubt that anybody is working on this aspect but yes this is possible but one needs to start some program on this aspect thank you sir for very good question thank you sir thank you sir my question is for asco kaita uh, there are some resistance for asco kaita but it's not full resistance sir we have to apply chemical at some point yes uh, what do you think about it sir so you are right but what happens that like for again for the different diseases and right now we can compare even with the covid 19 so in that in different indian states we are having the different isolates of the strain of covid 19 so what happens that for ascocyta blight also that you have the different strain and the depending on the resistance which we are introducing if this is only for one isolate two isolate like this kind of thing not other then you will not be having so basically idea is that we need to have the good resistance so basically we need to have the different sources of the resistance and until unless we have you need to continue to use this spray but of course this spray number will be lesser so this is one of the issue with many of these biotech pathogens because you are always having lot of different kind of strains and the isolates unless you got the resistance for each and everything and you pyramid them together thank you sir hi sir this is manoranjan biswal from uh, jnkb jawalpur phd student my question is that sir in heat stress condition what is the correlation between the heat and the protein and the correlation between iron and zinc my first question second one how to screen the functional stay green trait in heat stress condition gp what aspect we go for the screening of this trait yeah so one is that again for the heat stress the majority of time and either this is drought or heat and recently one of your colleague also mentioned about salinity so majority of time what happens and heat this is some of our work and also especially from dr gor 
So this indicated that when you are having this exposure to the heat and this affect the reproductive stage and basically avoid the pollen grain and then you cannot have any poly basically pollination, flower formation, etc. So these are the important areas. Now you are asking that, well, how to measure these things? Sometimes even this is very important, the how to differentiate heat versus drought, how to measure these stay grain traits. So for that, in my opinion, we have not done this kind of work in our lab, but in my opinion, we need to use some controlled conditions where you need to define these different temperature. And at that time point, you need to measure those traits. So that's the only one way. So in field condition, how to screen it? Well, in field conditions, uh, they have done this thing at the different temperature. So now, for instance, again, this is the breeding work, not the molecular biology work. But what Dr. Gore and other people have done, that instead of doing the sowing in the month of September, October, which generally chickpea, farm, uh, chickpea breeders or those people do, they do in the month of January or February. And then when based on the germ plasma screening, they found that which plant remained the green at even the temperature of the 40 degrees Celsius, etc. But the second question is that if they remain green, this does not mean that they need to provide the yield. But now if you can identify those kind of lines and then use the genetic analysis by developing some population or the genetic dissection, then probably you can identify some of those traits that what traits are influenced by when the plants remain green or what kind of changes happens in the physiology when you are having that basically the seed formation or the yield. Uh, Dr. Rajiv, I am Anita. Yes, madam. Uh, How sir, are you? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, as you know, sir, and that's uh, in Madhya Pradesh or Central uh, um, Central India, there is a problem of uh, disease, uh, and uh, uh, there are the different diseases, and also drought and heat. So how can we uh, develop a variety which have uh, resistance to multiple disease resistance and also heat or drought? How yeah. can we improve with uh, help of multiple diseases? So for that uh, very good question, madam. And uh, so generally, if you would like to follow the tradition, I'm not using the traditional breeding, rather I say traditional molecular breeding like MAVC, etc., then this will be difficult. For yes. this reason, what we are doing now, and we use the genomic selection approach. So what we do, that we, we develop our models based on that field phenotyping data. So for instance, when you put this thing in your, at Jawalpur region, Jawalpur re area, and you are screening your population there, and then you are measuring the yield. And basically when you are measuring the yield, this is coming as a result of the exposure of that crop for the different stresses. Either these are the biotic, abiotic stresses, etc. And then we basically do the sequencing of entire genome of all these lines. And then we train the model that even in the natural environment, when you are having this kind of genes. So basically we are developing this model based on that genome wide marker genotyping data. And then we develop the model that if you are having this combination, this combination, then this will be that kind of line. So based on the GS model, we can suggest that what kind of crosses you should be making. And once you are making those crosses, then when you are getting this progeny, how to carry forward. So this approach can provide you the lines which will be giving higher yield in your conditions where you were growing the chickpea for last several years. So we can discuss more in the detail, madam, on this aspect, but I think this is a really good approach. We need to work in this particular direction. Thanks. You have also been molecular Thanks. breeder, madam, because you also developed this molecular breeding line in the background <laughs> of JG70, isn't it? <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, I think, I think, uh, I, uh, first of all, I'm sorry for uh, being uh, offline for some time. Uh, and I think uh, that uh, uh, Dr. Anita Babbar uh, soon uh, will be able to, uh, you know, give this variety for uh, various trials, advanced varietal trials, etc. Uh, and uh, now I, I just want to uh, invite uh, our team, Faculty of Agriculture uh, and uh, uh, Director Extension uh, later on for uh, some uh, observations. So, Dr. Dhiran. Uh, okay. Thank you, Dr. Varshney. A very good lecture that is on advances in chickpea genome, genomics and molecular breeding. You have provided base for breeders, chickpea breeders, that they can now do anything. You have provided the base, and they have to now provide varieties for farmers. 
and i hope uh, in the double tour madam anita and in uh, sihor yasin they too will do, do justice with the farmers of madhya pradesh not only for madhya pradesh of india because the base is very strong now they they have to know only uh, plan and uh, achieve the goal so we have the university is very thankful to you sir you have provided this much time for us and make it valuable and we are really very thankful to you for this lecture thank you thank you very much thank you very much sir for your kind words thank you very much it's really pleasure dr om gupta uh, ma'am if you would like to say something she is not there uh, then uh, i'll ask dr anita babba to uh, uh, say some uh, few words uh, vote of thanks dr anita babba okay sir uh, thank you for the wonderful informative session dr rajkumar i hope our students and faculty and faculty members gathered a, a a great insight from the knowledge and expertise of dr vasne and shall apply the same in their pursuit of successful learning and career dr rajiv vasne and i go a long way with equiset and jenkin bee collaboration programs uh, on various projects of chickpea and molecular breeding uh, i have learned and upskilled myself from their exposure with dr vashnan i extend my great regards and sincere thanks to dr vashnan for for taking the time out of his schedule to add value to our student and the faculty uh, and the faculty learning experience uh, sir i take this opportunity to invite you to visit jnkuv interact with our student and uh, see our crop improvement chickpea and further guide us in future aspects on genomic and molecular breeding uh, uh, it's my pleasure to inform everyone that more than one uh, 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 158 participants from jnkvv and other colleges and other international institute attended and benefited from this lecture on behalf of department of plant breeding and genetics i extend my thanks to dr dhirel uh, parisa dean faculty of agriculture jnkvv for his support and guidance to conduct this lecture i would also extend my sincere sincere thanks to director extension services dr om gupta and dr uh, and di and dr abhishek shukla for their presence and valuable remarks i convey my thanks to dr uh, dean uh, jnkvv for sparing his valuable time for uh, this scientific uh, session um then sir um, we also thankful to dr sharad tiwari professor and head plant breeding and genetics for the efforts to conduct this lecture um i also like to mention dr ashish kumar for all his correspondence with dr vashne in making this lecture possible thanks to um, uh, engineer uh, sharad jain and uh, mr alok rajput for providing the technical support in smooth running of the lecture thank you everyone and all for taking time have a great evening sir thank you thank, thank you thank you thank you everybody thank you dr vasne